needed to wait until you were on. Hola, Lisa. Hola. Again, this is the Roar webinar series. I'm Josefina Bonita, and with me is Dr. Lisa Coleman. Dr. Coleman, I was just doing that, fixing my yeah. hair. Well, yeah, because see, it's just sticking up at the top. I just, there's nothing I can do. Oh, well. <laughs> so, so what happened was there were people already online, and I didn't realize that. So I was, you know, checking my ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no. tell me it's a little floppy, so I was trying to make it work, but oh well, you know, there's nothing I can do now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought today we can talk a little bit about <laughs> you know, now it's flopping in my in my face. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk a little bit about leadership. Okay, let's yeah. do it. I think um in order to be an effective diversity and inclusion practitioner, you also have to have incredible leadership skills. Yes, incredible, yes. Incredible, because there's so many um, so many aspects yes. that you have to kind of bridge and we've talked about some of those. Yeah. Um, so I thought that would be kind of the lead for discussion. I've also told participants if they want to um, have particular questions to either email them to us or right now if they have them they can put it in chats and we can as we go through uh, or 30 minutes together we can start talking about them so what do you think about that leadership that sounds great I mean leadership is a huge the thing about leadership is and I, I've been thinking about it actually because I just said this that the president of Harvard University his name is Larry Bacow uh, Larry was the president of Tufts University when I was there and I worked for him and that was my first chief diversity officer role. And I remember one day I went into the office and we were talking and we were just talking about what I, you know, my job and his job. And he said, you know, your job is, is the most closely aligned with my job. And I thought, that's interesting. You're the CEO basically, right? Because he's the president. And so, and he said, yes, because you have to think about the entire right enterprise. You have to think about talent management. You have to think about data analytics. You have to think about the finance. You have to think about right the students and the faculty, which in, in a corporation would be the employee base, and right trends that are coming forward. You have to think about the external relationships, right, and then the fiscal relationships to those external relationships. You have to think about right the the differential impacts on particular micro communities and macro communities, right, within the within the enterprise. And so once he started to say this, I was like, yeah, that's exactly that's right. right. I am the CEO. I am. That's right. I'm a CEO too. But really, it's true. And I, I actually have been surprised. I mean, we've seen some CDOs go to CEOs and C, uh, presidents, but I've been surprised uh, at how people haven't tapped into that. And, th and by the way, this is no self-promotion for those people out there. I'm situated perfectly where I am. I'm not trying to be the CEO of you know IBM or something. No, I'm just saying- it's it's really important to think about yeah um, your the leadership role. skills are you can apply those leadership skills the Absolutely. dexterity the ability to deal with confrontation media external partners internal partners all of those things and those are leadership qualities yeah and that's why I think that a CDO should be in the C-suite. Absolutely. Because I think if you look at a CDO, they affect the business strategy, the informational strategy within the company, the, the IT strategy. That's and exactly the, right. The organizational structure. All exactly. three of those. Exactly. Every part, right? That's, and that's what I meant about that Larry Bacow moment, right? Every part of the organization diversity is an inclusion are embedded and obviously equity should be embedded within that. And so you're, you should be touching every part. So that's why you have to be in the C-suite, right? You can't just be, and so, and I know we talked about this before, just being in HR, particularly for companies in, in higher education, right? Uh, diversity officers aren't all aren't in HR often. They can be in student affairs, which has its own problems. But if you're just in HR, then often you're not touching the other areas, right? Of the organization. 
And it's, it's okay to be in HR. I'm not saying that being HR is always negative, but you have to then think about how are you touching the other parts of the organization? Because often HR is about talent management, benefits, you know, those things, but it's not about IT. Right, it's not about the IT infrastructure. It's not about right, the external relations, right? And so those are the things that your DEI officer really has to be a part of. And I will say this now, and that's what companies are finding, right? Those companies that had DEI siloed right now are like, why are my black employees upset? Why are my Latin ex uh, 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 employees upset? Why are people protesting globally? Yeah. And they don't understand why, because they haven't done what I call as a full asset analysis. Mm -hmm. Where are your assets across the company? And when one asset is disrupted, that's probably related to another asset. And so you have to figure out how to quell those disruptions. And right now, a lot of companies are having a lot of disruptions because they haven't dealt with climate and culture. Let's talk about the individual, right? As a CDO, we're tasked to come in and disrupt all sorts of business strategies, right? That's what we do. Yeah. Right? But um, there's not a lot of support yeah. for us, right? So um, in addition to having a network of folks that you can tap into, there's these other things that I think as a CDO, you have to go through and be able to deal with, like, um, um, what's uh, self-imposed barriers. Oh, yeah. You may not think that you should be in that C-suite or you know you should be, but you don't know how to have that discussion. You know, yes. you kind of just got this job, right? So right. that's one. And then I'll let you uh, kind of elaborate on, on these two. And the second one is um, what's that uh, imposter syndrome? My God, what am I doing here, yeah. right? And those are two key components that a lot of CDOs have to deal with in addition to perseverance and all these other. Exactly right. right. And we can talk about that. Yeah, for sure, Josefina. And the, the barriers that are self-imposed, often sometimes what's happening is we're getting signals from the company. So we begin to impose those barriers on ourselves because we're getting signals that the way we're pressing, the company doesn't like. So this is what I like to say. I always say, so when I'm delivering a lecture about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I like to set the standards or set the bar. So what I say inside my organization, even within NYU, I say 15% of you don't like me and you will never like me. Sometimes it's 20%. And people are always shocked when I say that. And then I say, I know that I'm doing my job when 15 to 20% of you are pushing against me. It can't be the same 15 or 20% in perpetuity, right? Maybe 5% is the same, but 15 to 20%. Now, if 80 to 80, right? To 85% of people don't like me, then we have a problem. Then I, I have to find, right? I gotta go, get, find myself another job. But if that's the case, then what I need to be communicating with my CEO is, yes, I'm pushing the right envelopes because I'm moving, right? There is going to be, and I think that's what we have to educate when we're talking about educating up, right? A lot of CE, CDOs have to educate up our CEOs. And so what we have to educate about is, yes, people are not gonna like us, right? We are going to agitate. That's why we, how we've been brought in. And I, in higher education, I use it like this. We always have a student protest. The student protest, people think is bad. I always think it's good because we're going to learn something. No, right? I, I like right. it. We're going to learn something and move ahead. So those self-imposed barriers, what I say is figure out for yourself, right, where the resistance is and how you can, right, navigate that resistance. But always remember 15%. And so that way it helps free you up right, that you can't, not everybody's going to like you and not as a CDO. So if you're someone who needs everybody to like you, get out of this business, get another job. And there are lots of jobs, do something else. Okay. Imposter syndrome. Everybody has imposter syndrome. The one thing I learned working at Harvard is that everyone has imposter syndrome. So I'm just going to tell you a quick story. First day, first, second day at Harvard, guy walks in, white guy, British accent. And he's like, I'm just so glad you're here. 
it's just so hard. And I'm like, why is it so hard? He's talking, talking, talking. He's like, diversity, it's just so important. And I'm like, is it? It's so going on and on and on. Did you pick up the accent? I, I picked up the accent in the meantime. Kind of and so I was like, okay. And then I realized after he was talking to me for about a few more minutes is that he was Cockney. And so he had a Cockney accent. So, 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 so. So you, you froze a little bit on me and I imagine that that's happening. So can you repeat that? And again, yes. it was super cool because it was like. Dit, 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 dit. <laughs> Like, he's like, oh, right, talking to me because he it, thinks he's been discriminated against in some ways by other, other British people because they can recognize his Cockney accent. About feeling like an imposter. <laughs> but we missed a little bit. After the accent, I'm sorry, for some reason you're, you're, um, it's freezing up a little bit, just a little bit. Oh, Fina, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you that well, but there you go. So Wait, Fina, I can't hear you. So I gotta call you now. <laughs> can you hear me now? Oh my goodness, this is- um, Yeah, I there. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I can hear you. Can hear you. Can hear you. Okay, yeah. For uh, well, anyways, you know what? We'll keep going. Um, but I, I, uh, <laughs> Ralph Tavares uh, says, "Oh no, I was hanging on every word." So <laughs> it was a good story, Ralph. Right. Oh, well, but can hear me. It's going in and out. Okay, hold on. Let me call on the phone so you can see. You can... <laughs> so he's also saying he suffers greatly from imposter syndrome. I think we all do, Ralph. Honestly, uh, for most of my career, I've wondered whether or not I was really supposed to be there. And somebody would actually say, who are you? And what are you doing there? And what did you do with the CEO? But uh, I think to uh, Lisa's point, I think everybody suffers from that. And she's calling us on the other line and I'll continue talking. Yeah, I can't hear you, Lisa, man. You can't hear me? Oh, there you go. No, I... Yes, I can now. Oh, we got two Lisas going on. Let's see, I'm gonna mute this other Lisa. Thank you guys for being patient as we uh, figure out this stuff. Lisa, I'm asking you to, um, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yes. Yes, yes. There you go. So I may actually just take you off this video on your end. But anyways, let's talk about, uh, go ahead and, uh, continue talking about, now we got two Lisa's going on, one's doing one thing, the other one's doing the other, but that's <laughs> what you just did. You know, Lisa, um, can you, you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, super, super. So um, what I was thinking that we, um, what I, we, <laughs> Don't worry, I, I tur I'm turning that off so you can't hear, you can't hear that anymore. Okay, good, super. So, you know, um, Ralph mentioned that he suffers from really bad imposter syndrome. And I was saying that I too, for most of my career, had uh, felt like that. Even as I went to school, I'm thinking, who am I to be going to school? And, you know, are people gonna actually get to know that I can't do the work? 
I thought that was funny. Obviously, Lisa did not. <laughs> I thought it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> So there we go. Good. Um, so you were talking about the guy and how he too suffered from that. Yes. And and imposter syndrome, I have to say, right? I know I'm, I've got some instability with my camera. So I'm going to turn that off for just a minute because you can still okay. hear me. But the, the thing is, is that the imposter syndrome, I was just saying, everyone has imposter syndrome. But the question is, right, like as you're trying to navigate that, you have to figure out, right, where it's stemming from. And so when I was saying before about how people, you have to realize you know, wh who you, how you're educating up and how right, the, the people are holding that, that what we say we have to come to work is our authentic selves. So how do you put your authentic self, how do you bring that authentic self, I think can be really difficult to ask to figure out. And a lot of that is testing the internal system. So again, when I said that 15%, right, then you have to develop, and I've said this before, that internal posse. Because the other thing is, you need the internal people to be able to tell you periodically when you've gone astray, right? When you're gonna tip into 30% of the people not liking you or something like that. That's what you need. You need those internal tests. Because otherwise, you'll just feel like, you don't, feeling like an imposter is often feeling like you're not sure, right? You're not sure if you're making the right steps. You're not sure if you're taking the right direction. And to figure that out often, you have to, right, have an internal barometer. And there, there has to be, be a way to, um, I know when I was doing sales for, international sales for a company named Cargill, right before I went in to visit a client, I would put on a smile, even though I was scared to go in. So you have to figure out little things that can work for you that you can come across as the confident, uh, take charge person that maybe you're not feeling at that moment. And I say this all the time. I'm an introvert, right? I'm a person who often is, I don't, I don't, I am, I often have felt like an imposter in my life. And what, and mostly because I'm not a person who's an extrovert. So I need, um, I'm a typical academic in that way. I like to have lots of research, lots of information, but that's not always possible. So then I have to figure out for myself, what is the information that I need to feel like I can go forward? And that's what I mean about figuring out what it is that you need in your own individual. That's what I meant about figuring out about the imposter syndrome for yourself. For each one of us, that goes back to the individual question. For each one of us, right, there's something that makes us feel more secure or more like our authentic selves when we go into a situation. For me, I like to be armed with knowledge, right? I, in, I, 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 am, I exist in the knowledge economy, right? I'm in higher education. So we're all about the production of knowledge. That's our bottom line. For some people, they want to go in armored with resources, right? Money or, or other kinds of resources. But you need to figure out what that is for you so you feel less like an imposter and more empowered to do the work. I love that. I think, too, as you're thinking about imposter syndrome, you have to be able to differentiate between the people that you go to for help as allies or people that you simply don't go for help. Like for example, if you're working on your, on your strategy, your uh, DNI strategy or uh, diversity, equity and inclusion strategy, you're not gonna go to the CEO and tell them that you don't know how to do that. <laughs> no. So you have to, but you have to shed your ego and be able to ask, like I would call Lisa, have that posse, as you said, and be able to say, look, I don't know how to do that. Can you help a sister out? Which is what I call and ask you all the time. <laughs> I actually even text that to her. <laughs> That's exactly right. And you've got to, right, figure out how to ask the right people for assistance. And I think Right, part of imposter syndrome, I mean, maybe the bulk of it is, 
just asking the right people for help. Yes. Yes. Right. And knowing who the right people are. Yes. And I mean, that British man, I say that he came to me <laughs> because he knew in some ways I would be the right person in that moment to recognize. And I did. And I was like, oh, you're Cockney. I get it. I get it. You are not what people think in this sort of larger landscape. Everyone just thinks you're British, but you're Cockney. And that has a real implication to the perception of other British people on you. Hey, we, we got this down packed, Lisa. <laughs> in the background, thank you, <laughs> um, So yeah, I was thinking about that strategies for a CDO to be able to persevere in this field because, excuse me, we talked about it a few weeks ago. The turnaround for CDOs is really hot. Some really? years, year, some less than a year. I think the average is three years. The average is three years. And I actually think as we go forward, right? I mean, and people have been asking me this a lot because there's so many CDO jobs right now. And so actually right now we're seeing people go in for a year, year and a half and come out. And I've been saying, right, and I think this is important to say. I think it's important to say to CDOs and I think it's important to say to companies, do you need a consultant or do you need a CDO? Right. And I think, right? So you've asked this question about for new CDOs and people going into organizations uh, on other webinars and we've had this, this conversation. And I think that the conversation has to be for some organizations right now, they don't need a CDO. They need a long-term consultant maybe a year, maybe two years. And that still is a way for some emerging CDOs to get a lot of right experience under their belt to do these large scale consultancy jobs and then figure out if that's the right industry for you. I have a friend, that's what she did. She consulted for two years and then right got a, a big company that she felt aligned with her vision and mission and then went to work for that company. But I think that sometimes CDOs, especially emerging CDOs, we can get excited about the role. We can get excited about something, but that doesn't mean it's always the best fit at the right time, right? And right now, what we're seeing is a lot of companies are emerging asking for CDOs. But I think the questions that we have to ask is, is the company ready, right? Is the company ready for a CDO? Maybe what they're ready for is a primer. Right. And the primer to get ready for the CDO and maybe what you can do. I mean, I have definitely gone into companies and consulted initially. And then, you know, I mean, maybe I didn't want to be their 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 CDO, but I'm saying like that was on the table. And so the question is, then, do you want that role? But I think that's a that can be also a really good way to go into an organization and to figure out, you know, if it's the right right one for you. Does it make sense? So you apply for the position, you get interviewed, you get an offer. Does it make sense to put that up as a potential instead of accepting the job, especially if you have some, some idea that maybe it's not what it seems to be? Yeah. Yeah, and I actually, I've done this with organizations. Now it's tricky, but it's tricky because if you really want a job now, I've, I've, I've been, a, I've been, I've had the luxury of more, more often than not applying for a job when I had a job. So that's different. When you have a job and you're applying for a job, you, so a lot of people feel more secure is what I'm saying, right? That you can bring more things up. So in that situation, sometimes I've said to companies, you're, you're not ready, right? I've changed job titles because I said, that's not the right title for this job at this time. So if it's a, it tells you something about the organization. If it's a learning organization is what I call it. If it's a learning organization, then they will listen and learn. And often you're not gonna be the first person who said this to them, right? So <laughs> more often than not, you won't be the first person who said, are you ready? And so there's probably some internal voice, there are probably some other folks. And so, yes. And, and I, I have said, you know, here, I'm willing to consult with you. This doesn't you know, preclude that, but let's say this is a two-year post, 
right? Which gives me the opportunity to learn, you the opportunity to learn. And then two years from now, let's decide if this is the right fit for the right role at this time at, for the company. Because there's some things that I'm gonna have to help you do to go back to the first question that you asked me that you all aren't gonna like. And so we're gonna have to figure out what that looks like in the long term. Yeah, and I think it's difficult. I think if, to your point, if you already have a job, you're secure. You have that confidence, right? But if you're looking for a new role and you are not currently working, it makes it a lot more difficult. And by the way, before you answer that, that ring is amazing. Come on. Thank you. You know, I'm always, I, I, I'm trying with the rings. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yes. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think when you don't have a role, right, when you don't have a position, we can get really excited and think, oh my gosh, I have to take this right away. Now is not the time to do that. Let me say that again. Now is not the time. Companies are really struggling. So where there is one diversity role, there are 20. <laughs> so, right? So now you have options. There's a plethora. So don't get so excited about one role. And I always say this. It's, in this way, it's like dating. <laughs> go on. You think you can go in and change the person, soup to nuts. You're going to make them who you think they can be. Brush them off and polish them up and make them just amazing. Um, no. That's right. They are the way they are. They came that way. Just like a company. It comes that way. You might be able to go in and, you know, polish it a little bit. But you are not going to change an entire company soup to nuts, transform a company in a year, in two years, in three years. That is just not possible. These companies existed prior to you and will exist post you often. And so the question is, how can you make incremental change? Just like when you're in a relationship, it's incremental and the person stays the same, core. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So we, <laughs> I'm just saying, right? I mean, we've gotta be like upfront about these things. And so in that way, Right, I think we have to think about incremental change, incremental transformation. And so as you're going into a company, right, it's just like new love. Don't get so excited that you're just blinded by that new love and you can't see anything else. You can't see the forest for the trees. You've got to pay attention, right? And be that. That's great advice. <laughs> <laughs> These changes, I kind of, as you relate them to a strategy, they're low hanging fruits that you can work on initially and things that are going to be more long term and that's how you have to put it so um to your point on dating i, I really like that, that was <laughs> i'm just saying right is there are things that are long term like you said things that are short term but i do think that far too often we just get really excited and and again by the way i'm not trying to quell people's excitement Excitement is amazing and we need excitement to get us through. We need excitement about these new, about companies. We need excitement about going in and transforming. But you have to but be realistic. I, you do we also have to be realistic. And I'll say this about negotiation. I know we're going to run up against time. As you're negotiating, negotiate everything up front. Lisa. Verbal, <laughs> verbal agreement. Oh, yes. Five years from now, I'm going to give you that promotion. Five years from now, I'm going to do that. It's all verbal. Yes, yes, we promise. Can Let's, you all see me? No, no. <laughs> put a ring on it now. Put a ring on it, like a relationship. Get the ring. <laughs> you need the tangible thing. <laughs> As, as Beyonce said, put a ring on it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So Lisa, I think that that's a great discussion for next week. We yeah. should kind of earmark uh, next week to talk about negotiation. Let's absolutely do that. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks everybody for being here. Sorry about the technical difficulties. No, no worries. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for joining us the Roar webinar series. Uh, make sure to mark your calendars for October 15th for the Roar Virtual Conference 2.0.
and our very own Lisa Coleman, Dr. Coleman is going to moderate the panel. So make sure you save the date. Talk Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.